what I wanted to do was um, you know, uh, suggest that maybe you direct some of this passion that many of you have for entrepreneurship and thinking about entrepreneurship in law. Uh, I talk to a lot of people around campus in various places and they say, oh, I'm an entrepreneur, I've got a great idea, I need a lawyer to fill out some forms, I need a lawyer to incorporate me, I need a lawyer to file a patent, and, and that's all fine and dandy, but that's not really entrepreneurship of the act of being a lawyer. Uh, that's uh, the equivalent of being a business manager and a technician. Uh, and I think oftentimes what uh, we, we don't uh, see and what I would uh, you know, direct your attention to, because I think you would uh, find it quite fun, uh, is the actual entrepreneurial process of being a The law is created continuously every day. And the tricky thing about law is as you create new rights, new values, you have to dress it up and make it look like it's been around for 200 years. So if you're actually a really good lawyer, it doesn't look like you're doing anything new. And I, I just wanted to kind of illustrate this with a few examples. So uh, the first thing is thinking about the parallel universe of value that law creates. Okay, when I travel to Europe, when I go to China, uh, when I get off the plane, and I'm sure many of you have traveled up, when you cross the border, they're not interested in you telling them your name, you know, where you live, who your parents are, what your family is. They're interested in this. For purposes of traveling around the globe, your identity, who you are, whether you get in and get out of that country, is symbolically represented in this legal document. The law creates symbolic legal forms that have value in and of themselves, independent of the real world in which we, which we live. So the passport is one example. Uh, another example, I printed out at this one page D, which is the deed to a certain piece of real property a friend of mine owns it in Florida. This is a piece of paper, but what it does is it symbolically represents a particularly described piece of property. And so the law creates a parallel universe of value and economic activity independent of the land and the building that's described in this piece of paper. With this piece of paper, you can go to a bank. The bank will give you a mortgage. And what is a mortgage? For hundreds of years, mortgage was considered a conditional deed. So if you didn't pay your mortgage, the lender could take your property and get title to it. For hundreds of years, no one thought until some lawyers got together with some finance people. You know what else a mortgage is? A mortgage is a constant flow of monthly cash payments. Could we monetize and somehow the law uh, symbolize that cash flow? So that the mortgage then has two parallel lives, so there's the real property, which exists in Florida, it's represented by this piece of paper, which is secured by another piece of paper, which is a mortgage, and that mortgage represents not only conditional claims to ownership, but monthly cash flow. Right? And in looking at the cash flow, we created the mortgage-backed securities market, uh, and from the mortgage-backed securities market, the derivative market, and interest rate swaps, uh, ultimately leading to financial collapse <laughs> uh, and, and recovery. But when you start thinking about the entrepreneurial opportunities in law, you have to think about the opportunities to create value in a parallel universe that the law creates through the development of new forms. Right? So lawyers sat around as entrepreneurs and created and innovated the idea of how you go from a mortgage that just is a conditional ownership claim to representing cash flow. So if you look at a, uh, a real estate project like Destiny USA, what are you looking at? Um, some nominal level of value is in the building uh, that's there. But what you're really looking at if you're someone who thinks about uh, real estate in an entrepreneurial legal fashion, right? you see there are all kinds of ways to divide that all up. There are ownership interests out there, there are easement interests, there are value of contract and licensing rights, there are cash flows from all the tenants that are in each of those uh, places in the mall. Those leases all have uh, credit arrangements, mortgage financing arrangements against them. So you can split that mall into hundreds and hundreds of pieces 
ownership interest, and you can take the rent flows of Destiny USA and then issue a security against it, uh, and uh, then float that into the uh, securities market. You know, that's what a lot of a large developments do. And all of these things emerge from lawyers thinking exactly as you are thinking about how do I start a new business? How do I come up with a new technology? Right? Lawyers sit around, what are the gaps in current law? Where are the places where uh, we can make money? One of the other types of examples is you're in New York City, in major metropolitan areas, you know that air rights are really bad. But what the heck are air rights? Air rights are nothing. <laughs> Some lawyers sat around and came up with the idea, how could we legally construct the idea of owning certain elements of the air? And create a legal system in which then business people could use this framework and this concept, this construct, to actually make money and have value and create a whole, whole new set of potential transactions to be uh, engaged in. So air rights, you start developing them, people start trading them, you create a market in them, then you get people talking about what about cap and trade? Cap and trade makes no sense whatsoever, uh, short of understanding things like uh, transferable development rights and air rights that lawyers uh, developed uh, earlier uh, in time. So there's a whole lot of opportunity to think about creating uh, entrepreneurial opportunities. A student of mine uh, that graduated from law school about 10 years ago, he lives in uh, Utica, uh, which was pointed out as a small city that's not known for you know, having a lot of wealth. Uh, he's now making well over a million dollars a year. What did he come up with? He looked at his estate will. <laughs> he did what some people think is boring work, do wills and estates. And uh, a few years ago, he came to me and said, you know, I've been looking at these estate laws very carefully, and there is a really weird gap in the way you just construct certain trusts for tax purposes, and how do you construct trusts People going into um, senior senior housing and going into nursing homes, and uh, so he devised a, a system looking at these gaps where you create trusts that intentionally are designed to fail the IRS tax for tax purposes. And what it allows you to do is to hide money from the government's uh, hands and put somebody in a nursing home, and it creates a tremendous amount of value for the people who have elderly parents or loved ones going into nursing homes because the government has a law where they, uh, you have to use up most of your assets before you uh, can get on Medicare. And Medicaid and go into a nursing home, uh, but there are ways in which by finding the gaps in these, these little rules, you can create uh, value. And then uh, that value uh, is paid for in new types of financing devices are built, uh, built around them. So, um, other things that uh, you could think of is uh, there are lawsuits now. Um, they've been around for a few years. I don't know if some of you uh, visit virtual sites, virtual uh, communities, right? And so you can uh, uh, actually, uh, this was on the Big Bang Theory last night, and actually broke in and stole uh, some of the, uh, the magical devices in the, in the world in which they were playing. Uh, people actually go to real courts and real judges and sue each other over money and activities and levels and keys in virtual worlds that have no existence. This stuff makes, at one level, absolutely no sense. But lawyers find a way to do what you're doing and thinking about new businesses to construct entrepreneurial opportunity right, that create value not only in the parallel of virtual universes of activities, but also add value back to the, to the real uh, activity that you so I would just encourage you to take all the kind of energy and passion you have for thinking about uh, how to create new ideas and invent new businesses and bring new value to the market. That how actually one way you can do that in law is facilitate someone who's an entrepreneur, either partner with them or help them bring their ideas to market, or actually think about how lawyers uh, who are, are good lawyers. A function to make value every day and create fully new relationships uh, that we, we never would have uh, thought of. You know, actually, one thing about the team is kind of interesting. We go back to uh, the English common law, the way they used to transfer property before they had deeds and kind of paper records. It's a sod, and you take that sod and you hand it to the person who's going to 
divide the property. So we need to get five or six really young kids and beat the hell out of them uh, so that they would remember uh, having seen this ceremony of passing the dirt from one hand to the other. And that would be the way in which people would uh, actually transfer the property. So the symbolic generation of ways in which to accomplish those tasks uh, actually uh, it's really interesting. And uh, if you go to a country like what, in the 90s, I went to China to help them work on property rights and the transition to a market economy. It's extremely interesting to see a group of people who have not grown up embedded in the idea of property rights deal with the questions how you own things, how you mortgage them and finance them, and just struggle with how do these things work. And we take all of it for granted. We take all of this starting a business and all the idea is something that can be done easily because we already have quite a complicated legal structure. So I thank you very much for your